Hello and welcome to the Queer Thess Experience. I am your host, Casper Oliver. I use they, them, and he, him pronouns. I am a asexual, non-binary performer, uh, podcaster, immersion theater actor, basically anything I can get my grubby hands on, I <laughs> throw myself into. <laughs> and this is someone uh, I am excited to talk with today because you were recommended to me by a coworker. Uh, we have a mutual coworker, uh, Amber, I believe. Believe it yep. was oh, Amber. Uh, oh, the absolute <laughs> delight uh but we're not here to talk about amber we're here to talk That's about a different you. podcast <laughs> <laughs> amber gets her own podcast <laughs> hi everyone i am amanda uh amanda noriko newman uh i am a also asexual i am also sort of like pansexual uh or panromantic i suppose and I in the, th in the theater world, I also have multi hyphenates. I am an actor, writer, director, fight director, aspiring casting director. Um, I'm also an immersion theater actor. I do a lot of things. <laughs> Which I am learning is very common with entertainers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it gets to a point where, you know, I, I'm just trying to make my way in, in this crazy industry as best I can. So it's like, I have a lot of skills. Please hire me. Yeah. The more skills you got, the uh, <laughs> the easier it is to find some place yeah. to settle yeah. in. Eventually you'll find the thing that fits for you. Yeah. And you know what? I it, what's One of the great things about it is that sometimes the thing that you find yourself super passionate about is a thing you never intended to pursue. You just sort yeah. of did. Oh, it's so true. It's, it's, yeah. Uh, that's sort of how I am with fight direction. I never intend. I also realized, I don't know if I said I use she, her pronouns, but I do. Um, totally forgot if I said that. Anyway. You, you didn't, um, and I, it also just right over my head. <laughs> nailed it. I'm doing so well. Um, yeah. I, I guess we'll start with the fight direction stuff because that's, one of the things I've done, not recently as in the world of COVID, but before that was doing it fairly frequently. Um, yeah, and it's definitely a thing that I didn't exactly expect myself to pursue, uh, which is weird because everything comes full circle. Uh, I, started, I started in theater in, by mistake because I was a competition fencer for five years. Uh, and then my middle school did The Princess Bride when I was in eighth grade. And I very distinctly remember uh, one day I'm going to my locker and my English teacher who knew I was a fencer was talking to the drama teacher and she sees me and I'm like, hey, Mrs. Flesher. And she's just like, oh, hey, this is the girl I'm talking about. And uh, I, I was like, okay, what did I, I do? I, I think I'm, I'm, I don't break rules generally, so I think I'm okay. Uh, and then he revealed that they were doing the Princess Bride and they need someone to, needed someone to do the fight choreography. And I didn't know how to do fight choreography back then, but I knew more or less how to hold a sword. And I think they decided I had enough sense not to stab someone. So it worked out. And that was my first real experience in theater. And I thought it was fun and cool. And so I kept doing it sort of off and on through high school. And then I majored in theater in college. And then I am five feet tall and half Asian. Uh, so I never honestly thought I was going to get work as a fighter because I'm tiny. I am a, t a tiny woman who, you know, don't, you don't always see that as yeah. the, the badass, so to speak. Um, so I did end up getting cast in the show where I met Amber uh, called The Video Games, which was live interactive theater with stage combat stuff. And I auditioned for it kind of on a whim because I knew the producers and was like, well, they won't be mean to me if I mess this up. So sure, why not? And it worked out and I just dis I discovered that I could do stage combat and could be hired doing stage combat. And so really decided to pursue that as part of my multi-hyphenate career. And then outside of the acting portion of it, decided to start choreographing stuff as well. That's cool. And so, because this isn't the first time that I've talked with anyone about stage combat uh -huh. and choreography of combat and stuff. Yes. And this is coming from someone who has taken one 
one <laughs> singular com- stage combat workshop. You know, uh, that's more than some actors, and I do think it's an important thing that they should learn. Yeah, it's like I feel like when you perform, especially when you're like us and do mm-hmm. all sorts of things. Oh, goodness, yeah. There's no useless skill, mm-hmm. you know? Like, I did, I took that one stage fighting course, and I've used some of what I learned in murder yeah. mystery shows. Uh, like <laughs> It was I, it was your combat course, was it, like, more unarmed sort of combat, or what sort of combat? It was basically fencing. Um, okay. So we also did a, a lot of the uh, the sword fighting that you would uh-huh. see on stage. Yeah. But uh, they also gave you just general advice. Like, if you mm-hmm. are going to use a weapon with, and land a blow, if it's on stage, then mm-hmm. you should attack the person where the sta- audience can't see. So, like... Like, oh. all of those things. Because stage combat is not about fighting. And little tangent, it's because I, as I said, I was a competition fencer for several years and I'm a very competitive person. Just as a human being, I, I like to win. And so I took a break from fencing for a very long time and then have since realized, yes, I would love to go back to competition fencing. I cannot do this because I know myself. And if I go back to competition fencing, there is no way I am going to want to be able to do it casually. Right. Uh, so it's like, okay, so this is just going to be an entire career path change, and I, I don't have, I can't do that. So stage combat isn't a competition. It's a partnership and storytelling, and it gets out those desires to stab people in a more useful way. <laughs> in an entertaining way that isn't in an actually... entertaining way. <laughs> that isn't actually uh, hurting anybody. Exactly. And, I mean, I do think... and. I, this is another tangent, but hey, this is what we're doing, right? Go for it. Um, one of the combat workshops I went to, and I think actually stage combat is such a um, an important thing, this the storytelling device that we have, because it is about using violence to tell stories. And the stage combat community is some are, ends up with some of the nicest humans you will ever meet, and the people I end up trusting so so much because you have to trust them to not kill you right. to not stab you so immediately you get these bonds and this partnership where it's like i i trust you so quickly and it really does there are, i've never been to a, a combat workshop or really even in a combat class where a, an actual fight has broken out and, that'd be interesting <laughs> right and it's it's it, we're all like passionate people and emotions run high and we get angry, but we h- learn how to channel those feelings into something productive and constructive, which is really lovely. Yeah. Because there's so much, so much rage in the world and being able to use those feelings in a way that not only is not hurting people, but is actually creating something new and something bigger. I, I really love it. Um, I always say days with swords are better than days without swords. So, you know what? That just sounds like sound advice. (laughs) 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 But like, and I I think that a thing that's um, that I've noticed, Mm -hmm. and this has just been in my experience. I've again, there was only that one class. And when I say I took a workshop, I I don't mean I took a workshop course. It was Mm -hmm. a one, two hour session. That was it. But with doing murder mystery shows, Mm -hmm. we have certain shows where there is room for physical altercations. And the Florida troupe, when I was director, would actually lean more into them. Like Mm -hmm. the 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 whole like finale of Best Laid Plans. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. I know that feeling. We we actually have a one actor and I, Tristan and I, when we do it, we have like started planning out when it's safe again. We want to have a full on brawl in front of an audience. I that would be so much fun. Uh, for the murder mystery actors who I've worked with, they they definitely know if I'm on a best laid plans, I'll be like, okay, so I know there there are there are many ways to do this slap. Uh, I have my ideas, and we will work through it. And if you're comfortable with this, this is how we'll do it. And I. And very, I think one of the most important things that an actor can learn to do is learn how to fall. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Because not, and, and that's like such an important thing that 
I get very sad that people don't know how to do and actors don't know how to do because you may never be in a sword fight on stage or in real life. I don't know. I don't know your life. Um, but you may never be in a sword fight. You may never be in an actual brawl on stage. However, as an actor, you will probably have to get from a standing position to the ground at some point in your career. It, it's just a way that's just probably going to happen. And the number of actors I watch who end up hurting themselves through just falling. And I'm like, no, but please don't do that. There are ways to do this safely. Ah! Yeah, especially when it's like you're like in the murder mm -hmm. mystery company and yep. you, you're one of the people that is like, well, okay. So if you're like top actor, you're going to play detective a lot, mm -hmm. which means you're means going you're to gonna die, die a lot. You are going to have to fall. And I have always told the actors, especially when I was director, mm -hmm. um, I don't know how to die properly. So I'm, I encourage you <laughs> to not do what I do. And there are actors who can die much better than me, who have yeah. a perfect, where they will spin and land on the fat of their thigh. Mm -hmm. And it's great. I am a dummy. And like, <laughs> when I die in like Midnight the Masquerade, uh -huh. I, I do this whole thing where I have the cup and I just fall to my knees and then fall on my chest. And it looks great, but yeah, it hurts. It hurts because my there knees There are ways take to all fall on your knees. There are ways to, to do a knee drop without hurting your knees. It does exist. I need to learn because I love the <laughs> knee drop, but I, I don't do it right. <laughs> it's great. It's dramatic. And that's the thing is actors, and I'm sure you, you've experienced this, you, you get into this headspace of you have to do whatever for the job yep. and you put yourself at risk so many times and in fighting and in stage combat and even just falling i i want to tell actors there are ways to make it look good there are ways for you to be safe and keep your knees you only get one set of knees really in your life so please take care of them and there are ways to still do it and still make it look cool without you hurting yourself I, uh I have and a I'm, lot of feelings about this. <laughs> which, which is fair because it's like a mixture of performance and also mm -hmm. just taking general care of yourself. Yeah. Like I have also noticed that a lot of actors love to be thrown around and manhandled because in so many shows that I've done, almost everyone, mm. al almost mm. everyone that I know prefers to be on the receiving end <laughs> Yes. <laughs> then yes. Then to be the aggressor. And I mm -hmm. think if I remember correctly, I had a director once because I was in a show called Act of the Imagination. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't any combat, but there was a it was before I came out as transmasculine mm -hmm. and so I was identifying very femininely. Yeah. And my character was to be grabbed by a man and shook, you know, like yeah. by her by her yeah, coat. Yeah. And the director made it very clear. And it's like Casper has all the control in this situation yep, because yep, yep. you are shaking Casper. And mm -hmm. that's always stuck with me and so I actually yes. I, I kind of want to delve more into that on mm -hmm. the your view and experience with that mm -hmm. sort of yes um from mo most of my experience actors mostly are not jerks mostly mostly of course there are jerks and because most actors and that's not to say that actors don't get big heads and actors have you know a lot of uh, feelings that way, but for the most part, for the most part, not 100%, but usually they do not want to hurt the person they are fighting with. They right. don't want to hurt their partner, uh, whether that is because they're not a jerk or just they don't want to get fired. Either way, they don't want to do that. So it is so much easier. And, you know, I've, I've choreographed all sorts of things, including like actual beatings and like like fights and chokes. I, I did a, a show for Hollywood Fringe a couple summers ago. Goodness, how long has it been? I don't know. Uh, but a couple summers ago where basically it wasn't a fight. It was like a beating in a stairwell where like this guy was like kicked multiple times and shoved into a wall and just like dragged up the stairs. It was, it was hard. But for the aggressor talking him through that was a lot har harder than teaching the actor who was receiving the violence uh, to take that violence because there, there are ways to do contact like stomach punches and certain things to make them safe. 
and that's all a physiological thing. Whereas you have, as an aggressor, you have to put yourself in the headspace of, I need to be mean and aggressive and really violent and hurtful, but also not do that. Right. <laughs> but also not do any of the things that my brain is telling me to do. And so many actors, for the most part, are timid in, in enacting this violence because they don't want to go over the edge, which is so good and so lovely. So that is a huge part. That has been my experience for the most part is they don't want to actually hurt their partner. And because of that, they get scared. Yeah. And so it is part of my job as a fight director uh, and part of the recipient of violence's job as an actor to in to build that trust, right. build the trust in in their partner of I if you ever end up going over the edge, I will stop you and I will let you know that. And as me as the fight director to be, hey, look, trust me, I know. And I will walk you through the steps to make sure this is safe and make sure this looks good. Yeah. Um, generally that has been my experience on that um i don't know if that was your question but <laughs> yeah i know it, 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 it did very much go into like kind of the territory because it's been more of a i always joke like my my reasoning for explaining why people were more comfortable with being like thrown around yeah. versus being the aggressor is that we're just a bunch of freaking masochists <laughs> like that is also else very possible would we go into the <laughs> arts of all things but, but yeah. i but, mean that is also probably true <laughs> your you, your your response makes a, a bit more sense <laughs> <laughs> but oh uh, no it's it's it, it does delight me because it's like you there's also certain people like in mm -hmm. for for example best laid plans with the smack mm -hmm. i love to play the character who 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 does the slap who who yeah. is the aggressor in that situation uh -huh. that is my favorite character but that <laughs> is my least favorite part of the entire show mm -hmm. because everyone who ever plays the recipient has almost always been a very good friend of mine and i'm just like ah, uh, uh. i don't want to hurt you and so like we practice the stage smacks like the of smacking course. of the hand or like i'll do the smack they'll go with it, and then th they will smack their hand somewhere else there are and so many ways to do it there's uh there are ways to do slaps that look like they're like for theater in the round there are ways to do slaps so that it can sell from all points of view and most actors who have been that character when i'm on this i'm like okay so i'm teaching you the in the round slap now yeah <laughs> this is and, how we're doing it <laughs> and what really sells it is how the person who's getting slapped responds mm -hmm. to it because yep. it can it can sound like a perfectly timed impact sound and they yep. had but if they just kind of do and then don't really respond it's yeah but well, I, I mean it's like a I I feel like I, I read somewhere you never talk about a movie having a bad beginning right right you talk about oh the movie the movie had a bad ending that's yeah. because by the time you get to the end of the movie if the ending is great you have forgotten the fact that the beginning may not have been as strong right right. So it's the same thing with a, with a slap, when any sort of fight, whatever. If the ending sells it, they're going to be much more forgiving if the beginning was not perfect. Yeah, like there was um, uh, two of my favorite stories that involve mm -hmm. things like this. Yeah. Is um, one was a, uh, a best laid plans where for once I was actually <laughs> playing the character who got slapped. And that, yeah. that that's only happened once uh in a three or more actor <laughs> and i i told the the gal who was playing the person hitting me i uh -huh. was like listen if you don't feel confident with a stage smack just hit me oh, i hate when people say that no i know and like ah! looking back i shouldn't but at the time like she was so freaked out about the stage smack and mm -hmm. i was like and i also didn't think that it would come to it but the show was such a disaster it was, oh, no. a, it was a it was they were drunk by the time we got there oh and it i was, know and shows. yeah and so <laughs> the time came for her to smack me and like i told her i was like if you're gonna hit me just give me a warning grab me by the lapel and yank mm -hmm. me yeah if, if you yank me i know it's coming 
Okay. <laughs> and so I had a heads up. She did it. It was great. And it echoed oh. through the room. It didn't hurt. I don't know how she did it, but like my face was red, but it didn't hurt. And oh, like geez. I proceeded to fake cry and my hat and glasses flew yep. off my head. Oh. And the entire audience, mm -hmm. like, that was the only moment the entire audience went dead quiet <laughs> and they paid attention oh. and this is when i was still her director so she came to me immediately after and was like i i'm, I'm are I'm. you okay <laughs> and she and I, I told her i was like i pulled her aside and just in character i was like that was amazing and then walked up because it it, it got the response that we wanted from the audience oh goodness but the one time that the oh, execute no. that the execution wasn't good but the response was amazing uh -huh. was a planned smack midnight at the masquerade some mm -hmm. one of our lunas does a thing where when she quits she slaps reginald on her way out ah! if reginald's <laughs> played by one of us yeah and i was playing reginald and i was like oh we have to do that oh that would be so funny yeah. and she we didn't make a good impact sound like a good mm -hmm. smack but the timing bes and for everything else is perfect i spun collapsed on the floor and just yep. proceeded to start crying and everyone thought she had just punched me like not slapped <laughs> but because the, <laughs> because there was no smack sound they thought she punched me and like i think maybe yeah. two two tables felt bad for reginald everyone else cheered for luna and i'm like yeah oh yeah. god um yeah. i once did a uh an 80s show where i was where i was a uh, detective i was johnny um and we had one of my friends who also does stage combat in fact, she is much, much better than me at it. Um, but she was playing Pat Minotaur. Oh, oh, where's this and going? So actually the the third actor on that show, who was our poison, said, Hey, I have two stunt women on this show. Can you guys do something? And we're like, Yeah, we can probably figure something out. So uh in that the the beginning where we're fighting and Johnny's like, you know, uh I I know talent when I see it and you know and and you don't have it she just starts screaming like hauls off and punches me uh stage punches there right punch right right, right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. but hauls off and punches me and then i start screaming like, Get off of my stage! like you know just really screaming so she runs off and she was so delightful because the second she punched me because also punching hurts uh yeah. knuckles they hurt it hurts a lot if you actually punch someone uh so she does that and then just like like shaking her hand like really playing it off and i'm screaming at her and after she walks off and yells everyone everyone else just like oh and i just turned like she just punched me <laughs> and i my favorite thing was like from the back of the the audience someone was just like you're fine and i'm like really <laughs> thanks guys thank you for the sympathy i'm gonna be dead in like two minutes <laughs> like, um, thanks <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, um, so that's one of my my favorite, like we just added, you know, if you have people who are comfortable with it, if you have people who can do that safely, it's it's fun to to do that sometimes. Yeah. And like I, I that's been done. Uh, there's this one actress and I um, the, the one who does mm -hmm. uh, when she's Luna, she smacks Reginald. Mm -hmm. um, but she and I have played Brooks and Junior so many times that we actually mm -hmm. act like siblings now. I love we've that. been Luna and Sal. We've been Bob and Summer. Like we've done, mm -hmm. I, I think over half the shows we've been Poison and Johnny. Mm -hmm. And we've made this game of how can we manhandle each other in every single show we do? And <laughs> it's it's not even always fighting. Like when she's Summer and I'm Bob, if she needs mm -hmm. to talk to me about passing out table teams, yeah. she'll grab me and shove me against a wall and make it look like we're having a fight, but we're actually yeah. just... And audiences love violence. Yeah. I. They just love the violence. I, I, I mean, I don't have any like scientific reason why that might be but may like i guess there is something to be said about the like watching violence and experiencing it is that's something you know we could all all probably put ourselves in that mental headspace situation at least to a mild extent so i guess there's something universal yeah. about it in a way i don't know uh, but I, I guess people are coming to a murder mystery so that maybe is they're true like, so they're hopefully expecting at least i mean some it's in the title someone's gonna die so yeah hoping to maybe make it dramatic yeah. <laughs> right 
so uh, yeah uh, i do want to ask also besides mm-hmm. uh besides stage combat yes um what other sort of things do you dabble in you obviously do murder mystery parties yeah um well yeah i uh i i direct as well uh, i direct plays um i be- again before covid i was in the middle of directing a uh, a play for a a theater festival that you know then March happened, yeah. um, but I do that. I, I write a bit. Um, I've written a couple of plays um, about various different things. Uh, one of the plays that I I wrote was has been produced. Well, a couple of the plays I've, I, I've done have been produced at various festivals. One of them uh, was nominated for um, like best physical theater piece. Oh. Uh, at the Hollywood Fringe Festival a few years ago. Gosh, I don't, where, what is time? Nah. Uh, I don't exactly know, but uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't know if I, I, I don't know if I necessarily consider myself like a writer first and foremost, but it's definitely a part of me. Um, I'm, you know, working with another murder mystery friend uh, on a web series and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, uh, I also, I also do that. Um, if you have questions about that, that's cool. Yeah, uh, I was about to say, what's this web series? Um, well, this is, hey Tim, this is for Tim Portnoy. Uh, it is actually his concept. It is about a high school speech team. It is sort of like a, a Glee parody, but no singing. And okay. no one's problems are real. Huh. It's very, I'm, I'm very proud of it. Uh, I, it I, I feel like it's a little self-centered to say it's so funny, but we've gotten, we've done a couple of like readings of earlier drafts and it has gotten a very good response. And once the world opens, hopefully we can look into to making it. And, you know, uh, Tim plays like the speech teacher, the speech team coach. Uh, I play one of the students who is gay and like her big, no, no one's problems are actually real except for the teachers. Um, but like my problem is like I'm gay and I came out and no one made a big deal about it and so now I'm upset that I didn't get like this big emotional like catharsis moment where I had to make people accept me (laughs) yeah (laughs) where it's like just everyone is really loving and supportive and I'm like but I (sighs) so yeah um, I have emotions to let out here I had feelings and you guys are just all being really cool about it um (laughs) And yeah, a lot of other things happen in it, but it has been very fun to write and, and and work on. So we'll see. Hopefully it'll get made soon. Yeah, when the world is not, you know. Not this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it's, I'm fine. It, I'm fine. It's fine. It's all fine. We're fine here. No, but that's actually the it's an interesting thing that I, I keep hearing when I'm interviewing people mm-hmm. again during COVID yeah. is the amount of people who are taking this time, you know, to make the most of it. Cause I mean, we're in mm-hmm. terrible times and I, yeah. I, I, I hate the term blessing in disguise. Cause this is just yeah. all Cause not, but <laughs> no, but making the most of it um, yeah. and creating so much mm-hmm. and I think that's be- beautiful. I, yeah, I feel like, and I, I'm very lucky in my situation. I've not had to worry about rent. I'm like, there are a lot of things that I'm very fortunate for in this situation. I also have intense anxiety about it. So, you know, that is how that goes. I, I, I like to say that there's really no wrong way to do to do this, to do quarantine, as long as, you know, you're not like going out, not social distancing and being an overall jerk and spreading things. Yeah. If you are social distancing, you know, you are taking the necessary precautions, you are wearing your mask, all of those things. Oh God, please, just for the love of everything, please wear a mask. Please I'm wear a mask. taking a statement on that. Um, yes, no, yes like, as long as you're wearing your mask and social distancing and not going to parties that aren't being safe and all those things, as long as you are doing that, there's no wrong way to do this. If you are taking this time and writing and and working on your craft and auditioning for things. Awesome, that's wonderful. If you're, you know, if all you can do is get out of bed, you know, that that is good. And that is a, that is a step. Yeah. All of our brains are different and all of our hearts are different and we all 
have to accept where we are and just, again, try to make the most of it. And if the most is, I woke up, I ate something. You know what? That's awesome. Yeah. Do that. Do that. <laughs> like, you know, you see people online, like, kind of comparing themselves, like, mm -hmm. in the sense of, um, like, this has been a, a thing for me personally, is, mm -hmm. like, you know, picked, started all these podcasts. And, yeah. and, and people have been, like, comparing themselves to that and saying that because they're not at this level that they're not doing well and no. it's like one i'm doing this so that i don't think about any of this over <laughs> here is that healthy probably not but second but how i'm coping yeah and second it's <laughs> like as you said as long as you're even even if you don't get out of bed, even if you stay in bed and just mm -hmm. watch YouTube videos on your laptop, mm -hmm. that is a that that can be a self care day. Yeah, which is also super important. It's it's so important to take care of yourself because that's how you move forward. Because this COVID will end one day, one day. I don't know when. I don't know how much will be fixed soon. I can only hope. And like everyone in our industry, I have seen jobs disappear. Uh, I was supposed to, over the summer, I was supposed to be in Washington State doing a, a Shakespeare festival. Obviously, that did not happen. Um, but, like, we've all had things go away. And that is so hard because half of our life is rejection more than half of our job is rejection oh yeah and so when you get something and then have to see it go through no fault of your own it's like well shoot uh great so the one thing the one yep. thing i got and now that no longer exists that's that's fun thanks um but yeah it's so my point is one day this will end one day and if the only way you can move on past past this is to make sure you are there is to make sure you survive it and if all you can do to make sure you survive is to take care of yourself well great you did yeah. that so that when this ends then you can do the work you need to do again you can't do the work if you have if you have forced yourself into a breakdown or yeah. forced yourself into worse like there's no way you can move past that if you're not there to move past it you know to yeah. take care of yourself. Yeah. I firmly believe that. Oh, yeah. And I feel exactly as you said, that our jobs, our careers are a lot of rejection. And so much. <laughs> you, you, you hear the, the joke, I'm not, I don't act for a living. I audition for a living and sometimes get to act. <laughs> like, <laughs> and that, yeah. that, that, that does take a toll on you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I took an audition techniques class in college, and it I, I don't always succeed in this, but my teacher for that was like, hey, you know, again, most of your job is going to be auditioning, so pick the monologue, pick the song that you want, and for one minute in that day, you get to be Joan of Arc, you know? Yeah. For, for one minute, you get to actually be the, the person you want to be on stage. Yeah. And even if that is even if you don't get the opportunity to be more well for that one minute i audition when i auditioned at least i got to be that and i don't always i don't always succeed in that mindset and sometimes it is just like oh my god another audition and another rejection and all of that and you know but i i try to to keep that in mind that you're still acting when you're auditioning i try <laughs> oh yeah and like there, there's times that you know there's there's some people who you know, have a really great streak of just, oh, I audition and I just get the roles. And then, you know, there's also uh, a lot of people who due to perhaps, like, you know, I know that a lot of trans people have discussed this, mm -hmm. but also um, people who are perhaps like shorter or taller uh -huh. than average or people oh, who yeah. are different body builds mm -hmm. will struggle because it's a very shallow industry. I, I, um, also, I'm half Japanese American, mm -hmm. uh, so I get the fun thing of I am a lot of things, and in the industry, I'm also nothing mm, uh, yeah. because I do not fit into many boxes, or I fit into a ton of boxes that, or overflow out of a ton of boxes because I 
don't quite look white, but I also don't quite look Asian, and I'm not quite straight, but I'm not quite gay, and I'm not quite any, and I'm five feet tall, and, but I also don't necessarily look like a child, and it's like, it's a whole lot of, the, yeah, the industry is very shallow, and yeah. I get, and I'm not the only one who experiences this, obviously, it's like, there's a lot of people who are, are in the middle. Yeah. And it's very hard sometimes to be like, but I, I, I used to joke that, or somewhat joke, some, somewhat just serious of, like, hashtag I swear I'm Asian, because uh, I am Asian, and I'm, you know, I feel very uh, passionate about Japanese American experience, especially, but because I am half, I did not play someone who was Asian until last summer in my career. Huh. Uh, so that is 28 years of life, uh, at least, got it, you know, at least like 10 of which, which were acting. I acted for like a decade before I got to play my own ethnicity. Which is wild, like wild, <laughs> not in the sense that I don't believe you. I do no. fully believe you, yeah. but it's just so wild that that mm -hmm. happened. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, Emma Stone played Asian before me. And if that doesn't make you crazy, it makes me crazy. Flames? Flames off the side <laughs> of my face. It's so true! Oh, God, yeah. And, you know, it, it's it, a historic problem in the, in, in the entertainment industry of whitewashing roles and not that... It, not whitewashing roles and especially Asian characters. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it still happens. And I'm just like... But I, mm, why? Yeah. <laughs> why is that necessary? Why did you do that? And like we, uh, I've talked about it on the podcast before with um, like trans people being overlooked mm -hmm. for trans roles and yes. queer people being overlooked for queer roles. Mm -hmm. But I haven't b um, been able to talk about that. Like we've obviously touched on race, but it's mm -hmm. primarily been me talking with other white people. So we're like, but we don't know how that like feels. So uh -huh. we're not going to do a deep <laughs> dive. It's not Fair. our but it's not our place, but mm -hmm. it's, pff, how do I talk about it? It's like this, the same issue with different roots and different expressions mm -hmm. of different oppression. And so it's yeah. like the, the, the same core issue is that mm -hmm. people are being overlooked for roles that they should be cast in. It is in. very hard to have an, to be told you are not enough to tell your own experience. It's, yeah. Yeah. And... I, what, well, tell me about the first time that you played played a Japanese character. Uh, yeah, it was actually, um, it was a monologue. It was like seven and a half minutes of me on stage talking. And I was like, I am so sorry, everyone watching me. I don't know if I'm entertaining enough for this monologue, but cool. Um, it actually was very well received. I was very proud of it. <laughs> there was that anxiety because it was just me right. on stage. Um, it was for a... For Hollywood Fringe last summer, where it was for a show called Paper Trails, and it was three very short pieces. Like there were a couple. I was the middle piece of between a couple of two handers, and basically, uh, the the theme that connected them all was sort of how we keep records. Hmm. Um, and so my story was the the author. It was basically her story and her great grandmother's story yeah her great grandmother's story um of how the family did not the japanese side of her family did not really know their last name or her great grandmother did not know her maiden last name she okay. had taken her husband's name and then that sort of side of the family kind of didn't die out but like just the records kind of fell to the wayside and sort of how that all came together. And it was this really cool story of the way sort of how the, how World War II kind of erased this part of her identity. And this was Japanese in Japan at the time. So it not Japanese American, which is a whole nother, yeah. whole nother <laughs> experience. And I can, and that's my family's history. So we right. talk about that too. Um, uh, but basically uh, in in Japan there's like a, a name a family book where like names are kept 
and like the family book kind of had disappeared and from her mother her great grandmother's maiden name side mm -hmm. uh because she married up like she married into yeah. a, a higher sta status family so she just sort of adopted that and so it's like well hold on what about all of that stuff and how she how her great grandmother worked really hard to preserve the name and the status of the family she married into but that name kind of went to the wayside so it was it was interesting and the author was telling it from her own perspective more or less and the author is also part japanese american like me so it was cool to be like yay i'm also half japanese american and i get to to do this for once in my life um so yeah it was um it was cool it was it was very cool and uh it was it was that that summer i had i was traveling a lot that summer so i had told myself you know you don't need to audition for hollywood fringe it's fine this is the year you won't do it you'll relax and then like two weeks before fringe uh, a friend of mine tagged me in a post saying they were looking for a Japanese American actress and I'm like well I don't know if I have time but I really want to actually play my ethnicity for once in my life so cool and then I got it and it was great yeah, and it just it's still like I I do want to definitely kind of talk a little bit if, you, if yeah. you're fine with it um yeah, more please. about your experience with being a Japanese American performer mm -hmm. um yeah. And like, because you, you often talk about the, the lack of representation. Yes. Um, like my fiance is um, Asian American. She, her mother's Filipino from the Philippines. Cool. And she's um, like always grasping for representation mm -hmm. of something that she can relate to. Yeah. And it's usually it's caricatures more than characters. Yep. yep. Oh, it's. A whole thing of like wow these are people with yeah. feelings and emotions and we don't always treat them as such um which is dumb uh yeah well so i am fourth generation japanese Amer for, yeah fourth generation japanese american so my great grandparents were the ones who came to america okay. okay um so my experience is slightly different from the one that i i was doing for the hood fringe festival uh because that was japanese in japan so my Japanese American history, the the big mark is the Jap is World War II and the Japanese internment. Yeah, that's a big part. My grandfather and what? Well, my mother's parents were both in camps, um, and uh, also the other part of this is the four forty second regimental combat team. Have you ever heard of the four forty second regimental combat team? I have not. All right, so soapbox moment. Uh, Get the, it. 442nd Regimental Combat Team uh, was the Japan and well, okay, the 100th Battalion, the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, and the Military Intelligence Service. Uh, all, especially the 100th and the 442, those were the Japanese American soldiers during World War II. They were a segregated unit during World War II, uh, and the Military Intelligence Service had a, a Japanese section and a German section for like translation stuff. Um, the for their size and length of service the 100th battalion and the 442nd are the most decorated unit in american history wow and no one knows about them ah you wonder why because and we and you know it's because you have to acknowledge that yeah. while they are you know winning medals and per, like purple hearts and and medals of honor you have to also acknowledge the fact that while they're doing this their families are still in camp yeah are still imprisoned with no with no trial and um, we don't like to acknowledge that we ever had camps on our grounds and and do yeah. again now mm -hmm. yep 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 uh i a few years ago with my my grandfather uh before he passed on i we went to the site where uh his camp was and he was interned at the gila river camp in arizona and the gila river camp especially is interesting because it was on a Native American reservation. So not only have we, you know, all, and I, I you know, I, I'm not, Nate, I'm not uh, First Nations, so I cannot really speak on that experience, but not only did we take this country from these people and put them on reservations, but then we took this other and group of people and stuck them there. 
And it's in like, camps. well, in camps. And I'm just like, cool, 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 cool. So all of, all of this is terrible. Yeah. Oh, bad. Um, so I, my experience with that, and I, it has taken me, be, especially because I am half, uh, it has taken me a while to sort of come into this part of myself. Uh, to sort of accept this as like, oh no, this this is my story too. It's not yeah. just this thing. And it has been, it's been a, a bit of a, a journey with that as I've, especially once I graduated college and I started going to, uh, like they have reunions for like friends and family of of veterans uh, of the 442. It's friends and family of Nisei veterans. Nisei meaning they are the second generation. So they are the children of the people who came over Okay. from Japan. And that's generally the World War II generation. Yeah. So friends and family of Nisei veterans and their reunions for that. Uh, and so as I've gone, and I've been very fortunate to also travel to France and Italy, where these battles were fought. Right. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have experienced these things. And as I've done that, it's opened my eyes to not just how how much they were wronged because of the camps, but how much they were wronged because they have been ignored. And there are stories that I hear of the, these kind, the kinds of stories where I'm just like, that should have been a movie already. Yeah. Like, you know, stories of like family and, and love and, you know, insane bravery, like absolutely incredible acts of bravery, like, you know, like charges up hills, like taking out like nests of machine gunners and, and you know, a, a, like brothers saying like, I will take like a voluntary demotion of my rank so I can ship out with my brother. Things like that. And I'm like, uh, where is that miniseries? Where's, yeah. that HBO, where's that HBO miniseries, guys? Where is that Steven Spielberg film? Why are we doing Dunkirk again? Yeah. I'm and, curious. <laughs> and it's it's also not only is it not represented in media, it's not even in textbooks. Yeah. It's so it's, it's nowhere. I yep. 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 I I remember I was in a Barnes and Noble a couple years ago, I think, and it was like a a thousand and one facts you should know about World War II. And I flipped through it, and there is single mention of the internment camps. There is no mention of the 442. Uh, and I'm just, and the mention of the internment camps is like maybe half an inch large, saying it may have been a bad choice. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, no, it was a really bad choice. And you would think that the most decorated unit would, would merit a mention. Yeah. You would think. But no. Cool, Cause... guys. That's fine. Um... Yeah, so uh, I, the the Japanese American experience has been something that has clearly become something that I am passionate about. I'm not even joking. Where when we have parties and can go out and talk to each other, I will get a little bit tipsy, and then it's just like, "Have you heard about the 442nd Regimental Combat Team?" And just like slightly drunk Amanda, just like talking about the history at a party, and I'm like, "Huh, well." No one's told me to shut up yet, so I guess that's a good sign. Well, I'm gonna have to make note to invite you to my parties because I, I would, love I would love. I mean, I like, I just, it's like, all right, I'm gonna fly you to Florida. We're gonna get, actually. You know, I don't, I don't know if I want to bring anyone to Florida right to now. To Florida, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll meet somewhere. Else. I've been meaning to come see Amber anyway. I'll, I'll come, come out to way. LA. We'll have a party. When the world when, safe. Is okay. when the world is safe. Yes. Er, oh. I hope. I have stopped saying when things go back to normal because it never will. <laughs> and you yeah. know what? That's maybe that's no, that's, that is definitely for the best. Yeah, because normal is not great for a lot of people. Yeah, no, no. And it's I hope we can change. I hope we can just make it better. Yeah. Uh recording this on election day is very fun uh, that, that's yeah, yeah. 
I, this is not being uploaded on election day, but I want everyone to know that this is being recorded on election day. Uh -huh. And right before we hit record, we were both talking about how drunk we're going to get after this because uh, yep. coping. Because this is how I'm going to deal with the world. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a whole lot of, of crazy right now. And I'm assuming if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably more politically aligned with myself because I'm not entirely sure why you, else you would listen to a podcast called The Queer Thesperience yeah. if you liked Donald Trump. Nah. And if anyone I could is... be wrong. I could be really surprised in myself, but I'd be very, very shocked if the... Yeah. Well, if someone's <laughs> if someone's listening to this and likes Donald Trump, please stop. Go away. I don't you are, want if, you. <laughs> if you if you do like Donald Trump, please know that you are literally voting against everything that we are. Yeah. Everything. And if you if you are queer, <laughs> if you are queer, that includes you. Yes. Uh, if you uh, are queer, if you are Japanese American, or if you are any person of color. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it, he has not been good for this. No, oh. and you see a lot of queer people talking about like you see like the groups like gays for Trump or 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 um, mm -hmm. Nessa read an article earlier today talking about yeah. why a good amount of like Filipino immigrants are voting for Trump, and she and her mom are both like, ah! <laughs> yeah, they're both like, no, 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 uh, no. I I I have not seen too many. Uh, like I'm sure there are, are people who are in the Japanese American community who are voting for Trump because the world is a mess. Yeah. But uh, the most that I've seen has been like a, a Japanese American group that I, I think voted for him in 2016 and has since regretted everything. And I'm like, I don't know why it took you this long, but okay. Yeah. Yeah. But well, here you are. Yeah. And like a lot of Nessa, like Nessa's mom and uh, her aunts who are uh, her Tita Ning Ning and Tita Bing Bing, they, one of them lives in mm, Mississippi and another lives in Hawaii. And mm -hmm. both, like all of them are like just listening to them all talk. Granted, they sometimes start speaking in Tagalog and I can only tell by tone what they're saying, but they obviously are very <laughs> unhappy about the current state of things. And, and I'm like, That's I don't know what you're saying, but I'm willing to bet I agree with you. <laughs> Like, yes, agreed. Yes, yes, that. I don't know exactly what, but yes. Um, but I know you as a person, and I know that tone of voice, mood. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, right? Yeah. It's, <laughs> and it's, but one of the things that I do love about the entertainment and arts world yes. is while there is a lot of problems with how, how, how I've worded it in the past, and this is my belief, mm -hmm. and I'm sure some people don't agree with me, mm -hmm. is that the industry is very flawed. Mm -hmm. The community is beautiful. There are beautiful people. I mean, there's mm -hmm. obviously very flawed yeah. and very bad people, but like yes. the, the system in which the entertainment industry is built is inherently flawed yes. and is just screwing most of us over yes. <laughs> for one reason or another. But there mm -hmm. are so many beautiful people and like- yes you find the indie films or the indie projects and mm -hmm. the small production companies are usually where the gems and the changes are happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there is, uh, when it, people discuss moving out to Los Angeles to try to make their careers, there is always a statement of like, you have to find your people. And the thing, the good news is there are people to be found in everything. Like I, I'm sure we've both found, people in murder mystery we've found oh, yeah. uh like i've definitely found a lot of my community in um in the stage combat like stunt world like i have i i it's interesting because the past few months have been very disheartening for many people of course oh, yeah. uh but i and i'm not saying that i am special in this way but i've become slightly misanthropic of yeah. i i once was very certain that people are at their heart good. I hate the fact that I don't know if I believe that now. But what I will say about this view that I am slowly possibly adopting much to my chagrin is if that is true, then I'm a very lucky person. Because even with, even if I, even if everyone or a lot of people are at their heart bad, I have somehow managed to find the good people. And yeah. 
I try to take comfort in that because I cannot say that the people I love and the people I've worked with and continue to want to work with, because obviously you work with the people who are like, nope, never again. But the people, but like, I have not struggled to find people who I want to work with again because they tell stories that are beautiful and they are good people. And so even if the world is terrible and maybe people are terrible, I have to count myself lucky that I have found the people who are good in that. Yeah. You know? And, you know, maybe, and I, I, I think that a lot of people, like, one of the reasons I like to believe that there's good in everyone is because I'm like, there is good in everyone. So help me God. Because there better be, not, right? Um, there had better be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think, you know, we're artists. Yeah. We have to find that right? Because yeah. as an actor, you sometimes play people who are not great. Oh. And you can't play people who are not great as not great. Right. It's, you cannot judge them for that, right? Yeah. Right. So as artists, we have to find that yeah. in individuals. And I feel like, and I've been told this is a thing that uh, someone who I had on a while ago uh, mentioned that this is a trait of actors, but also a trait of queer people. And I thought that yeah. was a very interesting correlation where we kind of in just naturally mm -hmm. look through other perspectives. Whether or not we agree with them is a totally mm -hmm. different thing. Yeah. But we can imagine where someone's coming from. Mm -hmm. Even if we are like, okay, I can see where you're coming from, but that's a stupid ass opinion and it's mm -hmm. wrong. I can see why you think that, yeah. but that's wrong. <laughs> like, Ooh, uh, yeah, I guess. I don't know. I think, I think it comes at least uh, from a storytelling perspective. And there have been like, there have been studies on how, you know, straight cisgendered white men like shut down any story that is not about straight cisgendered white men. And that is because mm -hmm. more than any other community, more than people of color, more than people who are queer or, or, or transgender, like, or cisgendered women like yeah yeah more than any of those communities straight cisgendered white men have said oh well I can't relate to this person because they are not a straight cisgendered white man and it is because all of us who are marginalized have had to force ourselves to look through that perspective yeah. right we have had to identify char with characters who don't look like us who do not um live like us yeah and because of that, we have had to make ourselves more empathetic. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, so I think that's probably true is if, if you are, if you are queer in any way, you have had to live outside yourself. Yeah. Just based on the world we live in. And what makes it unfortunate too, is you see a lot of queer people. Um, and this has been a topic that's been discussed mm -hmm. many times, but it's still yeah. true where queer people relate to the villains mm. because so often the villains are written to be the most like us mm. you get the queer coded disney villain disney is yeah. notorious for it yeah you get the yep. queer coded disney villains the sunday the saturday mm. morning cartoon villains and and yeah queer kids looking at that going oh that's me that's me yep yeah and mm -hmm. it's not that we're bad it's that that is the closest we are seeing to ourselves yeah yeah that yep <laughs> I, just, I, I don't know how to how to, to to say it other than no you're right and it's sad that that's how we have to live but i mean yeah yeah that's kind of how we are how things are written and, and you know when i i remember when i watched the avengers the first time and i'm like oh i'm bruce banner okay cool I'm I'm the, the the nerdy scientist who turns into a rage monster. That's who I am as a human. Yeah. Cool. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know that you know that uh, moment in the Avengers where Loki is I'm a god, you dull creatures, and the Hulk goes smash, 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 smash. <laughs> um, that moment is me. Good. As a uh, person, uh, I am both of them. That, that's fair. I am I am both. Loki saying I am a god and Bruce Banner smash or the Hulk smashing that god. Um, that is a snapshot of my psyche from moment to moment. 
snapped. <laughs> I, I've always, what's funny that you say that is I've always joked that a snapshot into my head is like those times where uh, like Tony gets the crap kicked out of him and he's <laughs> obviously, obviously hung over and his PTSD is flaring and he's just laying on the ground like, this is okay, I'm okay, this is fine, <laughs> like <laughs> bleeding from the mouth, but he's like, no, I'm good, I'm good. Oh, I think I've broken every bone in my body, but I'm working through it. I've done this before, <laughs> what's sleep? I, mm. he, Tony didn't get to sleep till he died. Oh <laughs> like, uh, yeah, I mean, honestly. Ain't that the truth? Ain't that the truth? <sighs> I, uh. but you know, it's great if nothing else. I, um, <laughs> I would like to start to kind of get to a, a slight, a slight little upper note where yes. if nothing else, we are starting to see more representation mm -hmm. because yeah. people in our age range are in the seats of people making shows like Legend of Korra mm -hmm. and Steven Universe yeah. and yeah. Uh, OKKO OK where we're getting representation um, of queer she people. Oh, she Shira! I need to watch Shira. It it's so good. I finished it recently. I just went through it. It's quite lovely and it makes me very happy. Anyway, yes, watch Shira. Yeah, and, she <laughs> and what's so funny is I, I mentioned this because I'm I'm waiting for someone to feel about it as passionately as I do. Um, and it will happen someday, I'm sure. But mm -hmm. Transformers is such a token machismo movie, like by yeah. the Michael Bay movies, which are uh, Michael <laughs> Bay. Accurate. Um, but the comics, like the IDW publishing comics of Transformers, yeah. especially Lost Light and More Than Meets the Eye and all that, have mm -hmm. canonical gay characters who are married to oh, each other because Cybertron is full of male aligned mechs. They're gonna fall in love with and marry each other. Mm -hmm. Like, and then there's also yeah. canonical trans lesbians. Amazing. And, <laughs> and I'm like, Amazing. From trans Why are we not doing this? Yeah, I mean, they, they, they put the oh, trans in Transformers. <laughs> a, uh, I, I feel like that with, with She-Ra a lot, because in, in the reboot, a lot most of the characters are women. Like, 90% of the characters are women. So, yeah, they're gonna fall in love. Like, come on! It's like, yeah. you, you surround yourself, like, you can't assume that just because you are surrounded by women, one of, uh, there's not gonna be a couple that they're that they're not gonna fall in love like that's absurd yeah that is an like, absurd statement so yeah if i see a group of strictly female characters and none of them have fallen in love with each other what i'm pulling that from that is not that they're all straight but that every single one of them is aromantic and you cannot mm -hmm. change my mind they are still queer just not what you not wanted what <laughs> you know um they're, they're definitely they're not straight uh <laughs> no not they can't all be straight it's that's not uh that's impossible it's mathematically impossible i i, I agree with that um <laughs> i i definitely oh god have you watched avatar the last airbender i've watched a good chunk of it yeah okay my my new headcanon is that zuko is ace yes oh i can get behind that yes that boy is awkward as heck around people of all genders um his panic does not quite feel like gay panic to me, although maybe that's part of it. But I'm just like, oh, you don't, you don't even get it. You don't even uh, think that it's happening. So, nope, you are ace, you are my little ace boy in my brain. I, I so. can get behind that. I like that. Yeah, and if nothing, <laughs> if nothing else, you know, we can just claim these characters mm -hmm. for they're, ourselves. They're mine now. Yep. <laughs> Like I um like I love the Persona series, uh -huh. um especially Persona. I don't know. Okay. Persona super well. Um, they're my favorite in the series is Persona Five, and I have said this before. Mm -hmm. I will say it again. I don't care if I get flack for this. I love Goro Akechi. He is garbage, but I love him. I have a tattoo. Yep. Um, but I played the game, and I'm like, oh, you're a gay trans boy, aren't you? Oh, you are so gay and so trans. And I every time I, I play these. the game, and and a lot of the fandom is actually like. Even the voice actor is like, yeah, he's a bit gay, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. He's a bit gay, isn't he? I love that. He That's literally hilarious. canonically flirts with the main character, who's a man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he literally, he literally, <sighs> anyway, that's that's a total mm -hmm. other thing. But you just, you claim these characters. Uh, also, um, if you have, like in, in Avatar, uh, in the, there are a couple of novels about Ki Avatar Kiyoshi. Uh, and she is canonically bisexual. Is it like, isn't she the one that 
Not Kiyoshi. She's like the one, like the really badass one, right? Who yep, yep. killed that Eugene, Eugene Yang from the Try Guys cosplayed her recently, I'm pretty sure. Did he probably? I'm she is uh, my my favorite thing about Avatar Kiyoshi. I mean, there are many things. She's probably my favorite avatar. Uh I've I could talk about Avatar a lot if you couldn't tell. Um, <laughs> but she is uh she's the one who like stops Chin the Conqueror and yes. like makes her own island because why not? Um she is in the novel described as being super tall and huge. Like she's just a very tall woman, uh, who ends up like falling in, in love with one of the other girls in in the series. And my favorite thing is she's this big, tall, powerful woman who can move mountains, but then her girlfriend does something cute and she stumbles over her own feet. And I'm like, yes, I love you. You're oh. perfect. And I love oh. you. Also, uh, the, the, I, that was the character that was cosplayed. I'm going to have to send you. He did, he did a, a video on Twitter where he did like the TikTok trend of him holding yes. a shoe. And uh -huh. he, it, there was like this audio clip of like, these are her shoes. She must have had big feet. Yes. And, and then yes. he like flips the boot and then kicks his leg up and then just transforms into the cosplay. Oh. And just, mwah, I'll send it to you over uh, Facebook. Please, please do. That sounds delightful. <laughs> that sounds so, wonderful. So, all right, we do got to start wrapping up. Uh, yes. This has been a very, it, it was very entertaining and also very enlightening. And cool. I, I, I've had a good time. It, it hasn't been full of laughs, but I feel like it's been a very good talk. Yes, I think so. I think, uh, again, we're, we're recording this on election day. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I, I think there have been a few laughs and that has been delightful. Yeah. And also I don't think we can, completely ignore the fact the world is happening no so, i i so think, i think it's been good yeah, apt for the, the 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 day we are recording yep i agree i absolutely uh, agree with that but well on a on a lighter note and to keep yeah. with the uh the general um form of the episodes mm -hmm. uh firstly is if you had advice mm -hmm. to give to yourself when you were kind of starting off on your journey um or someone who is in a similar boat as you where it's them trying to find themselves find their community mm -hmm. or someone who's trying to just find a time to play something that feels like themselves mm. what advice would you like to give to bestow to our listeners oh my goodness um your people who are listening to this are going to be listening so they can't see my face just making all of the expressions like what do I even say um I feel like you know what I would want to say uh to myself is you are enough to tell your story even if people haven't recognized it yet you may have to to fight for your own story and and how you tell it but you are good enough to tell it I guess Ah, I'm getting choked up. <laughs> like when you yeah. said that the first time earlier, I got emotional and like, <laughs> uh, sorry, that's like, I want that tattooed on my body. That is such good advice. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> and good. yeah, well, I, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to take that with me because that is so good. Um, and while I collect myself emotionally <laughs> over here, um, because I'll have plenty of time to get emotional and drunk later. So um, <laughs> where where can our lovely listeners find you on social media if they so wish? Um, well, uh, I am on, I guess my, my main social media platform right now is Instagram. I have a Twitter that I have, I, I think I've basically retweeted like political things recently. So I don't know if it's all that interesting but i am on instagram at amanda underscore noriko that is a-m-a-n-d-a -A -A underscore n-o-r-i-k-o that is my instagram where i will post acty things makeup things nail polish things i also like to do makeup and nail polish it helps calm my brain uh and also a lot of recently political things <laughs> because things it's the world yeah it's all the things world. um but yeah but that's, I suppose, my most uh, most active social media thing. All right. And if you're listening to this, uh, well, I mean, obviously you're listening to this. You completely um, blocked it out. You put on a podcast and <laughs> listened to nothing. 
yeah, you just, <laughs> you, you played it and then muted it. Um, <laughs> uh, thanks for the algorithm, but. Uh, oh, why'd you do that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I will put uh, your Instagram handle in the description so that people Thank can you. go find you, of course. And uh, for obligatory podcast ending. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also find us on Instagram under Queer Thesperience, and we will tag her account on our promo image when we make it, so you can find her through there. Uh, you can also find us on Twitter under just Thesperience, which is a play on thespian and experience. Uh, we are currently at the schedule of every other Friday. We upload interviews with other queer entertainers uh, from all across the entertainment industry, all across the queer community. Uh, everyone has a place to share their voice here. Here. and uh, it's so exciting to bring on everyone so be sure to follow us and you know the drill if you like this give it a rating and it helps our boosts Woo! and blah 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 all, all that, that jazz, jazz. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you have made it this long why not last just a few more minutes because I at the end of this will play a trailer from another queer podcast that I personally think that you should go investigate and check out and see if it's up your alley but before that this is Casper and Amanda signing off. And remember, all the world's a stage. So give them one heck of a show. Until yeah. next time. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Hello, hello, ghouls, ghosts, goblins, and everything in between. Welcome to Across the Veil with host Emma and Zelda. We're two amateur cryptozoologists on a mission to explore the things that lie. Beyond. Beyond what? I, I, I don't know. The, the veil? It, it just sounds poetic and mysterious. Mm, true. <laughs> Learn about cryptids, folklore, monsters, and things that are just kind of haunted. Anything that seems a little otherworldly and strange. Just like us. <laughs> New episodes out every Thursday on all of your favorite podcast platforms like Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at across.the.veil and Twitter at acrossthevale one.